Hello friends, welcome to our channel. Today we're going to take a look at another horrible case with you. The case of Amanda Plass. Amanda Lynn Pla was born on December 11, 1990, in Choppy, Massachusetts. She grew up there with her siblings, Emily and Nicholas. According to her mother, Michelle Myas, Amanda was a free spirit, often jokingly told that she was born in the wrong generation. In 2011, Amanda worked as a waitress at Friendly's in Chappie. At the time, she was dating 27-year-old Seth Green, a carpenter. On August 26, 2011, Seth called 911, frantic and crying, reporting that he had found Amanda unresponsive on the kitchen floor of her third-floor apartment. He described her as already unconscious, with multiple wounds visible on her body. Seth was in shock asking the operator to send both the police and an ambulance. When paramedics responded to the emergency call, they found Amanda deceased from multiple stab wounds, including injuries to her chest, throat, and abdomen. The police promptly secured the crime scene, cordoning off the house where the incident occurred. Upon their arrival, officers encountered Seth on the porch, visibly distraught and in a state of shock. A thorough search of Amanda's apartment was conducted by detectives who sought to gather evidence from the crime scene. Although the perpetrator had fled the scene, they left behind crucial clues. Initial observations revealed a substantial amount of blood splatter in the kitchen, leading detectives to conclude that the attack had taken place there and that the likely weapon was a knife, which the perpetrator had taken with them. Furthermore, police discovered visible shoe impressions from Nike sneakers on the floor and broken glass in the room where a palm print was also found. The brutal crime's motive remained a mystery, but detectives suspected Amanda knew her attacker and that personal animosity drove the crime, given the nature and number of wounds on her body. Consequently, the primary suspect was Amanda's boyfriend, Seth Green, who was taken to the police station for questioning. Amanda's death was a devastating shock to her family, with her mother, Michelle Mathis, struggling to come to terms with the severity of the situation. Sadly, Amanda's death was not the only heartache her family would have to endure, a topic that will be explored further in due course. As I mentioned earlier, the police took Seth Green in for questioning, which wasn't surprising given the circumstances. He was the obvious first suspect, being Amanda's boyfriend, with blood stains on his clothes, and the one who had dialed 911. It transpired that he and Amanda had started dating less than two weeks prior to her death, and her family knew very little about him. Although he was seven years older, and might have had differing views on certain matters, it was unclear whether this could have led to an argument that escalated into a brutal crime. The investigators naturally considered the possibility that Seth might have committed the crime, claiming Amanda was already dead when he arrived at her apartment. They established that a two-hour window existed between Seth's 911 call and Amanda's death. This time frame would have allowed him sufficient opportunity to destroy evidence and dispose of the murder weapon. Consequently, the detective's primary question was whether Seth Green was responsible for Amanda's death. Seth appeared at the police station, visibly shaken and distraught, overcome with grief over the loss of his girlfriend. His tears flowed freely, prompting the investigators to wonder whether his emotional display was genuine or an attempt to divert suspicion from himself. During the interrogation, Seth explained that he had been at work all day and had planned to drive Amanda to the restaurant where she was employed but his own work commitments had prevented him from doing so. Although their relationship was relatively new, Seth claimed that he had strong feelings for Amanda and had no motive to harm her. Seth was a carpenter at a construction site. The investigators questioned him about the tools he used for work, implying that he might have used one of them to commit a crime. As a carpenter, Seth wore a tool belt on the job, which held various carpentry tools, including a knife. However, he claimed that he always left the tool belt at the construction site after his shift, and this particular day was no different. After finishing his work, Seth changed out of his work clothes, left his tools behind, 
and went to meet Amanda. Seth was the prime suspect in his girlfriend's death, but he maintained his innocence. Ultimately, the police verified his alibi. He even passed a polygraph test. The construction boots he wore when they arrived didn't match the Nike sneaker prints found at the crime scene. Furthermore, his shoe size was significantly larger than the prints, and the palm print on the glass didn't belong to him either. Considering all the evidence, the police cleared Seth's name. Amanda had put up a fierce fight, so the attacker must have had scratches. In the weeks following the crime, the police found skin particles under Amanda's nails, which they thought would lead to a breakthrough. Unfortunately, after testing the DNA sample, they couldn't find a match in any of their databases. The motive behind the crime remains unclear. Although there were valuable items in Amanda's room that could have been targeted in a robbery, they were left untouched. Moreover, the police did not find any signs of forced entry. There are two possible explanations for how the perpetrator gained access. Either Amanda knew the person and let them in voluntarily, or she might have accidentally left the door unlocked. Amanda's colleagues and friends were interviewed by investigators who discovered that the crime might have stemmed from a love triangle. Prior to Amanda dating Seth, she was in a relationship with another man, but their breakup was acrimonious. According to those familiar with the situation, Amanda initiated the breakup, and her ex-boyfriend was reportedly unhappy about it. Unrequited love often drives people to make rash decisions that have devastating consequences. As a result, the investigators looked into this lead, but ultimately found nothing. Amanda's ex-boyfriend provided his DNA and fingerprints, neither of which matched the samples found under Amanda's fingernails or on the broken window glass in her room. Moreover, he had a solid alibi. The police explored various leads, but none led to a breakthrough in solving Amanda's murder. As a result, the investigation stalled. Determined to seek justice, Amanda's family took matters into their own hands. They distributed flyers and sponsored car races, hoping someone would come forward with crucial information. Michelle, Amanda's mother, acknowledged that her daughter was not faultless, but she couldn't fathom why someone would take her life and why no one was willing to cooperate with the police. However, Amanda's family soon faced another distressing challenge they discovered that several police officers had taken photos of Amanda's body with their personal phones and shared them with others, including civilians. According to the police internal affairs report, Sergeant Keith Lame, a senior officer responsible for securing the 73 School Street apartment where Amanda was fatally stabbed on August 26, 2011, was among those who took the photos. He emailed the image from his cell phone to another police sergeant, who then passed it to a patrolman. The officer subsequently shared the photo with civilians, including coaches at a youth football game. Records reveal that Lame captured a photo using his cell phone. He subsequently sent it to Sergeant Jeffrey Godare, who then forwarded the image via email to patrolman Chad Levesque. For unknown reasons, Officer Levesque chose to share the disturbing photo of homicide victim Amanda lying on her kitchen floor with other football coaches. Captain William Jeb, the internal affairs officer, reported that the photos were shown to at least three coaches at a youth football game in Agawam the day after the homicide. Around the same time, Patrolman Terry Deck, responsible for logging all apartment activity for state police, took a photo of Amanda's body and sent it to six Chicopee police officers via individual emails. The investigation found that all six officers deleted the emails without reporting them, and no disciplinary action was taken against them. Their names were not mentioned in the records. The rest of the officers involved faced consequences for incompetence and failing to meet work standards. Deck and Lame, who took the photos, received formal reprimands while Godair and Levesque were punished with three unpaid shifts. Following Amanda's stepfather's call to the police on September 28, 2011, an internal investigation was launched. His friend had claimed to have seen photos of the crime scene, which had taken place a month earlier. 
Despite their best efforts, it wasn't until about two years later that a breakthrough was finally made in the case. The investigators re-examined all the evidence to determine if they had overlooked any crucial details. In Amanda's bedroom, a previously unseen clue caught their attention on a dry erase board. The handwritten message read, Dennis was here, 811, which became significant since it was dated only 15 days prior to Amanda's body being discovered in her apartment. What was striking was that this critical piece of evidence had been in plain sight the entire time, yet nobody had noticed it until now. It wasn't until investigators started asking around that they realized they didn't know who Dennis was. The name didn't come up at all during the entire investigation. So detectives decided to dig deeper, scouring Amanda's phone records and social media posts to see if she had any connections to someone by that name. They also interviewed her friends, family, and co-workers, and that's when Amanda's ex-boyfriend shared some interesting information. He told them that Amanda's apartment had been broken into several times when she wasn't home, and that she suspected a young Puerto Rican man whose name started with the letter D. Amanda had tried to handle the situation calmly, as she knew the guy, and had even met with him to talk about the break-ins. However, when she brought it up, he denied any involvement. Amanda then revealed that a neighbor had seen him in her apartment and politely asked him to return her stolen belongings. But the guy got defensive and stormed out. Now one of the most crucial tasks for the investigators was to find out who Dennis was and whether he was the one who took Amanda's life. They discovered that at the time of the crime, a man named Dennis Rosa Roman lived just three blocks from the house where Amanda died. A background search on Rosa Roman revealed a history of breaking and entering. However, there was no palm print to compare to the one they found at Amanda's home. The police located Dennis in Westfield, Massachusetts, and requested that he come to the station for an informal talk, but he refused. When they spoke with him, he appeared extremely nervous and agitated. However, in November 2013, 22-year-old Rosa Roman unexpectedly showed up at the police station. The police inquired about Dennis's relationship with Amanda, and although Dennis acknowledged knowing Amanda from their hometown, he claimed he hadn't seen her in a couple of years. His response was plausible, given that Amanda had died two years prior. Next, investigators asked if he had ever visited Amanda's apartment, and Dennis replied that he had never been there, saying he didn't know her well at all. He revealed that he occasionally sold Amanda marijuana, explaining that these were the rare instances when their paths crossed. During the interrogation, Rosa Roman consented to provide a DNA sample from his mouth and disclose his shoe size, which matched the shoes found at the crime scene. The officers observed that Rosa Roman was wearing Nike Air Max shoes, the same brand as the footwear documented in the bloody tracks at the crime scene, but with a different tread pattern. After providing his DNA, Rosa Roman declined to answer further questions from the investigators, promising to return to the police station in a few days to continue the conversation. At that point, the police had no grounds to detain him, so he was released. There were concerns that he might flee, which could have stalled the investigation. Amanda's phone records revealed that she had nine conversations with Dennis on July 28, 2011. The records indicated that Amanda initiated four of these calls while Dennis made five calls to her. Later, Rosa Roman returned to the police station having kept his promise. However, he altered his approach, claiming that he occasionally communicated with Amanda. He alleged that Amanda had confided in him about someone breaking into her apartment on multiple occasions when she was not present. According to Rosa, Amanda didn't report these incidents to the police because the perpetrator didn't steal anything of value. At this stage, the investigators had heard the break-in story multiple times and were almost convinced that Rosa Roman was responsible, entering Amanda's apartment when she was away. They were increasingly suspicious that the man was concealing information and they couldn't find an alternative explanation for his altered testimony. 
The only remaining questions were what he was hiding and how he was connected to Amanda's death. When investigators presented Rosa Roman with the photo of the dry erase board featuring the message, Dennis was here on 8-11-11, he suddenly recalled writing it, contradicting his earlier claim that he had never entered Amanda's apartment. The DNA test results proved he had provided false testimony as his DNA matched the samples found under Amanda's fingernails and the palm print on the glass was also identified as his. This conclusive evidence established a direct link between Rosa Roman and the crime. After realizing the police had gathered enough evidence for his arrest, Rosa Roman altered his testimony for the third time. He now asserted he was present at the crime scene and attempted to rescue Amanda from her attacker, suggesting someone else was involved. When investigators pressed him to identify the perpetrator, Rosa Roman declined supposedly fearing for his family's safety and his own. Nevertheless, he provided specific details about the individual who allegedly took Amanda's life. The suspect, according to Rosa Roman, was tall, white, light-skinned, blue-eyed, and weighed between 170 and 200 pounds. He wore old pants, dirty boots, and a t-shirt with the phrase, why drink and drive when you can smoke and fly emblazoned on it. Despite Dennis's testimony, Detectives remained skeptical, as all the evidence suggested that only one person was present when Amanda was stabbed. Rosa Roman was subsequently arrested and charged with Amanda's murder. The trial commenced nearly three years later, in 2016. Rosa Roman's attorneys presented a defense that their client was indeed present at the crime scene, but they maintained he was not the perpetrator of Amanda's murder. Moreover, they alleged that the police conducted a flawed investigation, suggesting that they wrongly accused Dennis of the crime after an unsuccessful inquiry. The defense team pointed out that despite having all the necessary information, it took the police two years to confront Dennis. Rosa Roman stated that on the day Amanda died, he was forced by his drug dealer to accompany the dealer to Amanda's apartment supposedly because Amanda owed the dealer around $500 or $600. The dealer demanded his money, so he took Rosa Roman to Amanda's apartment, where the situation escalated out of control. The dealer pulled out a knife and began stabbing Amanda. Rosa Roman claimed he wanted to intervene and help Amanda, but was unable to stop the dealer. At one point, Amanda grabbed his hand, which is why his DNA was left under her nails. However, the prosecutors had a different account of events. They thought Rosa Roman had broken into Amanda's apartment when she was away during one of his illegal intrusions. On one of these occasions, he left a message with his name on the board, which Amanda correctly suspected was written by the trespassing Rosa Roman. This led her to call him, demanding he return what he had stolen, resulting in nine phone calls between Amanda and Rosa Roman. On the day of Amanda's death, Rosa Roman broke into her apartment again, thinking she would be at work, but Amanda was home and a violent argument ensued, ending with Rosa Roman taking Amanda's life. After eight days of testimony and five hours of deliberation, a 12-person jury found Rosa Roman guilty of causing Amanda's death in July 2016. The court then sentenced Roman to life imprisonment without the possibility of parole. The internal audit of the police officers was delayed for many years. Finally, in 2018, Jeffrey Gadir was fired from the police force, but he appealed and was allowed to return to service in 2020. The commission ruled that he would be demoted to patrolman because of his misconduct and prior disciplinary record. On August 4, 2022, Massachusetts passed Amanda's law making it illegal for first responders to take unauthorized photographs of crime scenes. Violating this law is a misdemeanor, punishable by up to a year in jail and or a $2,000 fine. Prior to the law's passage, Amanda's family had sued the city of Chelmsford, eventually agreeing to a $100,000 settlement. Cedra's commune, located in the department of Santa Maria near Cord City in Argentina, was home to Hanna Rosa Berra, a 40-year-old woman with dreams of becoming a grandmother. Family friends described her as having a courageous character and adventurous spirit. 
When faced with starting over, she courageously moved forward. According to some reports, she lived in a tent for four years. However, the specific reasons for this remain unknown. Ana Rosa worked at the Secretariat for Children, Adolescents, and Families in Cordoba, a job she loved. She also co-ran an upholstery workshop with her partner Marcelo Fabio Ferretto. They met when she began sewing for his business. By 2017, Ana Rosa was 46 and Marcelo 51. They had been living together for a decade and practiced Reiki together. This complementary therapy involves applying palms to restore physical, mental, and spiritual balance. Nonetheless, the couple faced challenges and disagreements became prevalent. Both had four children from prior relationships. Two of Anna Rosa's children resided in Salto province. The other two were abroad, one in France and another set to become a father in Bolivia. Her parents and siblings lived in Cordoba too. Anna Rosa had a positive relationship with her colleagues who frequently met both her and Marcelo. He worked as a wallpaper maker with his workshop near their home. Close acquaintances observed him as jealous and controlling, which increasingly irritated Anna Rosa. On Sunday, May 28th, the couple visited relatives in Villa Lenz City. During their journey back, they argued intensely when Marcelo checked Anna Rosa's cell phone. The dispute continued at home into early Monday morning. Neighbors overheard them yelling and hurling insults at each other before things momentarily calmed down. Only temporarily, though. Hours later, Marcelo reported his wife as missing to the police. Despite various reports on when the man filed his report, most sources agreed he visited the 18th police station on Tuesday, May 30th. Marcelo informed the police and repeated to the media that he woke up at 6 a.m. that Monday morning, as usual, but his wife was already gone. He explained that Anna Rosa would typically rise early to feed the dogs before leaving home. Until then, everything seemed like a typical Monday, with Marcelo following his regular routine. The news of Anna Rosa's disappearance shocked Los Cerdos residents and the province. Her husband's statements indicated that the last time he saw her was Sunday night when they went to bed. Digital newspapers and TV stations reported Marcelo grew concerned upon receiving calls from Anna Rosa's colleagues puzzled by her absence from work, as she was not one to be absent without a valid reason. Marcelo recalled that on Monday, during a visit to a drugstore for some shopping, he stumbled upon Anna Rosa's white Chevrolet parked on Rainier Avenue in front of a beauty salon in Santa Isabel, strategically located between their home and her workplace. Her personal items and keys were in the car. Only her cell phone was missing. Marcelo claimed he had called her multiple times and even friends and children left messages, all without response. The last WhatsApp message sent by Anna Rosa occurred at 10.40 p.m. on Sunday, May 28th. Individuals familiar with the case remained uncertain about what might have occurred or if she fell victim to a crime. Since submitting his report, Marcelo has stayed in constant contact with police while also leveraging social media and traditional media to aid in locating his wife. During an interview with reporters, Marcelo noted that Anna Rosa intended to go swimming at the gym early on the day she disappeared and had plans to meet with a trauma surgeon later. The most critical aspect for him is having her home safely. Regarding finding her car, Marcelo described exiting the pharmacy on Monday afternoon to see her vehicle outside a beauty and massage parlor. Considering Anna Rosa had complained of neck pain earlier, he decided to check if she was inside the salon. As he possessed a spare key for the car, he opened it and went through her belongings inside. He mentioned briefly suspecting she'd perhaps left due to an argument early Monday morning, but soon focused solely on finding her. The sequence of events as narrated by Marcelo paints a picture filled with anxiety and concern over his wife's sudden disappearance. According to his Reiki teacher, if she decided to leave, he should leave her alone. Prosecutor Legandro Altatanello of Alta Grassi took over the case. The investigation began immediately. Initially, several hypotheses were put forward. On the one hand, there was the possibility that Honorosa was the victim of kidnapping or robbery. They also considered the possibility of revenge. It wasn't excluded that she left voluntarily. 
As part of the investigation, Marcelo testified for more than 14 hours on Wednesday, May 31st. He gradually began to fall into a series of contradictions that, to the investigator, showed him less and less as the distraught husband of the missing woman, and more and more as the prime suspect in her disappearance. Everything Marcelo said made no sense to the detectives. Plus, his moods went through different stages, which alarmed experienced forensic investigators. At first, he seemed euphoric, confident, constantly giving interviews to the press. Then he began to extol his innocence, giving details nobody had asked about, and even tried to justify himself by talking about his relationship with Ana Rosa and her anger at him. Marcelo also began to say directly and without question that he couldn't have done anything wrong to his partner. The circumstances of Ana Rosa's car appearing at the scene where it was found and Marcelo's explanation of its discovery raised several doubts. According to witnesses living in that area where the car was found, it was left by a man in gray clothing, not a woman. As hours passed, despair grew among Ana Rosa's loved ones. Despite intensive search efforts, there were no results. While the search continued, investigative authorities pursued leads diligently. The prosecutor in charge felt convinced Marcelo was hiding something and insisted on a deeper investigation into this suspect. On Friday, June 2nd, during another meeting with police officers, Marcelo changed his attitude. He became calmer. Yet when detectives presented him with cell phone antenna data, showing movements that didn't match his story, the man broke down and revealed the truth came out. Marcelo admitted to the tragic killing of Ana Rosa, disclosing that he ran her down and then dismembered body to dispose of the remains. Following his confession, he also indicated where he had buried the dismembered of his partner of the last decade. A few hours later, police supported by a canine unit discovered Ana Rosa's remains. Excavations began around 2.30 p.m., concluding the search and uncovering her dismembered body in a hole Marcelo had dug himself. This area was situated on a dirt road, located in the countryside opposite a factory and roughly 200 meters away from Highway 5, which links the provincial capital with Alta Gracia. According to prosecutor Peralta Tonello, Marcelo was quite familiar with this location as he frequently visited it for work-related purposes. Everything Marcelo had previously stated turned out to be false, except for mentioning an early Monday morning quarrel. For Ana Rosa's family and friends, their worst fears materialized step by step. The prayers and hopes that she would return soon shifted into pleas for comfort and justice following this devastating revelation. The grief-stricken tears of uncertainty transformed into cries of irreparable loss and anger directed at the killer who had deceived everyone for days. Marcelo's acquaintances described him as jealous and manipulative, someone who kept Ana Rosa preoccupied with endless questions and demands. His controlling nature came to light during the investigation when it was found that he had hacked into Ana Rosa's social media account after managing to crack the password. The profile gathered on Marcelo revealed he knew all of Ana Rosa's passwords even prior to committing the crime. According to reconstructed events, they had been fighting throughout the weekend before she was reported missing. Marcelo's extreme jealousy ultimately led to this tragedy. Amidst one such heated argument, he struck her multiple times with a sledgehammer until she died. Attempting initially to place her lifeless body in his car but failing, he resorted to using a knife to dismember it. He then placed the remains in his vehicle and drove to the location where they were discovered days later. Pleading guilty, a new search was initiated on Friday at the residence shared by defendant and Ana Rosa. Various tools, including cleavers and knives of different sizes, were found during the search. Marcelo was arrested and spent his first night in jail. He charges of aggravated murder, femicide, and gender-based violence, all carrying life sentences. Prosecutor Peralta Atema clarified that Marcelo's admission could not be considered a full confession. Thus, the record noted he admitted to the crime while being interviewed as a witness. Further statements would be made once sufficient evidence was gathered. Documents essential to the case include the final autopsy report, forensic analysis of vehicles and items collected during searches, 
and outcomes of luminol tests at multiple locations. The defendant's attorney, Jose Luis Saca, stated that despite Marcelo's admission, he would seek his client's release. He argued that police statements held no legal authority, but could guide the prosecutor's procedural decisions without being definitive. Additionally, the defense attorney stated his client would not provide any testimony. Examinations continued over the weekend, and on Monday, June 5th, a preliminary autopsy report was published. This report indicated that Anna Rosa's cause of death was severe head trauma. The defendant's lawyer mentioned awaiting the lifting of secrecy to review evidence against Marcelo. He emphasized that psychiatric and psychological evaluations were crucial in understanding Marcelo's emotional state possibly a significant aspect for the defense. On June 9th, it emerged that luminol tests conducted at their residence showed significant blood amounts had been washed into the patio area. The medical examiners discovered new insights after performing autopsies, noting cuts on the extremities inflicted by someone skilled with a knife. A significant wound, measuring 18 centimeters long and seven centimeters deep, was found on the victim's neck extending to the cervical region. Given these findings, the prosecutor's office charged Marcelo Fabio Ferreira with double aggravated murder due to his relationship with the victim and gender-based violence. After Ana Rosa went missing, her acquaintances shared information about her, her partner, and their relationship with both media and authorities. Viviana Lujan, a friend of Ana Rosa, mentioned that Anna started changing her style and stopped wearing lace-up shoes to work. She let down her hair and told Viviana that she felt prettier and more feminine. According to Viviana, these changes led to arguments with Marcelo. Other friends also noted that Ana Rosa had been in high spirits lately and seemed happy. She confided that she and Marcelo were experiencing difficulties but were making efforts to improve their relationship. The couple even took several short trips together. Marcelo's trial for Ana Rosa's murder commenced nearly two years after the incident. The prosecutor's office presented the gravity of the charges to the jury meticulously. Final autopsy results revealed that Ana Rosa suffered a severe blunt force blow to the face, rendering her unconscious. Subsequently, multiple blows to the head resulted in a crushed skull. During the first hearing, Marcelo chose to remain silent while witness testimonies followed. Deborah Territorios, one of Ana Rosa's daughters and the first witness, testified that since her mother met Marcelo, she had grown distant from her children and other family members. Deborah explained they were initially compelled to move from Salta with their father, followed by her older siblings' relocation. This geographic separation worsened communication gaps with their mother. She noted that when alone with their mother, Ana Rosa was loving and attentive. However, whenever Marcelo appeared, her mother became distant. Deborah even mentioned hurriedly leaving her mother's house whenever she knew Marcelo was about to arrive. Ana Rosa's cousin, Roberto Enrique Reina, testified about the events that transpired on May 28, 2017, in his house where the altercation began. Roberto provided a detailed account of the quarrel. According to his testimony, the dispute originated from a message Marcelo discovered on Ana Rosa's cell phone. However, Roberto noted that Marcelo's jealousy appeared typical and not particularly unusual, which did not substantially benefit the prosecution. The prosecutor highlighted the accused's dominance over the victim, pointing out asymmetrical power dynamics and objectification of the woman in front of others. In terms of gender violence, the case file referred to evidence of obsessive jealousy from Marcelo. He enrolled in the same classes Ana Rosa attended, synchronized their schedules, and exerted complete control over her movements. The defense strategy focused on modifying the charges and scrutinizing actions leading to Marcelo's confession to the police that he committed the crime. It is important to note that at that time, Marcelo was testifying as a witness without legal representation present. If it can be established that law enforcement was already targeting him when he admitted to killing Ana Rosa, his confession might be deemed inadmissible, potentially invalidating other associated case files. Nevertheless, the prosecutor argued successfully 
that Marcello's admission of guilt was evaluated against Supreme Court precedents and was accepted as evidence, despite lacking an attorney's presence during his statement. The second day of hearings saw continued testimonies. Notably, Fernanda Falimia, who was Ana Rosa's girlfriend, provided insights into Marcello's behavior. According to her testimony, he had been controlling and increasingly violent shortly before Ana Rosa's tragic death. Fernanda, a colleague of the victim, testified that when Ana Rosa started her relationship with Marcelo, she became distant, but later tried to renew their friendship. Fernanda mentioned that Marcelo tried to follow his partner's every move. Notably, he even started taking Reiki classes after Ana Rosa began attending them. The indictment indicates that after starting energy harmonization therapy, Ana Rosa told her friend she felt good. She had mended her relationships with her mother, sister, and children, and intended to visit her son in Bolivia. Yet, as these positive changes began, Marcelo's behavior grew increasingly aggressive. Fernanda reported that Ana Rosa once remarked that women could achieve things with a great attitude. Marcelo angrily retorted that they were all fools who would end up dying in a ditch. Fernanda also noted the couple hadn't been living in the same room lately. Ana Rosa slept upstairs, Marcelo downstairs. On the hearing's second day, Claudio Bustamant, a police officer who took Marcelo's statement on May 2, 2017, gave his testimony as well. He assured the jury it was spontaneous. Marcelo had confessed without any pressure from him during the interrogation. Marcelo mentioned that on Monday, Ana Rosa informed him that he no longer satisfied her and admitted to infidelity. He confessed that this revelation made him angry, leading him to strike her, although he could not recall with what. Marcelo then recounted falling asleep at the table, waking up later to go to bed. He described the experience as dreamlike and surreal. He firmly believes that if he had been fully conscious, he wouldn't have committed such an act. With visible emotion, Marcelo apologized to the community, Ana Rosa's family, and his own relatives for the pain caused. On April 11th, the jury of the 11th Criminal Court found Marcelo Favio guilty of Ana Rosa Barrera's double aggravated murder. He received a life sentence with the possibility of parole after 35 years, contingent on demonstrating good behavior. Upon hearing the verdict, the victim's family expressed their anguish and directed shouts and curses at Marcelo as he was swiftly escorted from the courtroom. The prosecutor remarked that the jury's decision aligned with the prosecution's request. Evidence demonstrated that Marcelo Favio acted with full awareness and had premeditated his actions against Ana Rosa. Prosecutors asserted that claiming a lack of full consciousness during the crime was a deliberate attempt to evade the maximum penalty. Hello friends, welcome to our channel. Today we're going to take a look at another horrible case with you. The case of Justine Valdez. Justine Valdez was born in 1993 in Aritao, a town situated 255 kilometers north of the Filipino capital Manila. She was the only child of Teresita and Danilo Valdez, also known as Tess and Danny. Justine attended St. Teresita's Academy, a Catholic secondary school in her hometown of Aritao. While Teresita and Danilo had moved to Ireland for work, Justine remained in the Philippines with family. In 2015, her parents were able to bring Justine to Ireland, and the family settled in the small village of Enniscary in County Wicklow, near the Dublin-Wicklow border. After arriving in Ireland, Justine immediately began working, studying, and building a life for herself. She was extremely close to both of her parents and maintained constant contact with them when she wasn't at home. Justin was studying accountancy at IT Talat and worked two part-time jobs as a care worker and as a waitress in a cafe in the bustling coastal town of Bray. In November 2017, Justin began a relationship with Joseph Squire. Joseph later described Justin as being happy and active, saying she never got up to any mischief. She was way too innocent for that. He added that she was literally the most innocent person I ever met in my life, and I will never forget her. On May 19, 2018, 24-year-old Justine Valdez spent her afternoon with a routine she was familiar with. After completing paperwork for her residency permit, she went to the gym for a workout, 
wrapping up around 4.20 p.m. Justine then planned to head home, and her mother, Terrace, sent her a quick text asking her to pick up some bread on the way. Justine obliged, making a stop at the store before catching the 185 bus bound for Bray, departing after 6 p.m. The bus dropped her off at the village of Enniscary, a familiar stop near her rural home. From there, a 15 to 20 minute walk typically separated her from her doorstep. This journey, though not arduous for a young and active woman like Justine, became fraught with worry when she failed to return home. Terrace, accustomed to Justine's punctuality and communication, grew increasingly anxious as time passed without word from her daughter. Calls and messages went unanswered, prompting Terrace to venture out in search of Justine. She scoured the streets, stopping strangers to inquire about her daughter's distinct Asian features and sporty attire, which stood out in the crowd. Despite sightings of Justine disembarking the bus, her whereabouts remained a mystery. Teresa's frantic search yielded no answers, leaving her with mounting fear and uncertainty about where Justine had gone and what could have befallen her on her seemingly routine journey home. With each passing moment, Teresa's worry deepened, driving her to scour the streets for her daughter and any potential witnesses. Justine's disappearance left her mother in a state of distress, unable to find any trace of her daughter. In desperation, she reached out to the police to report the situation. Detectives promptly took her statement and initiated a search for Justine. At 5.20 p.m., Justine, still wearing her gym clothes, took the 185 bus from Bray to Enniscary Village, arriving at approximately 6 p.m. From there, she had a 15 to 20 minute walk until she reached home. It was a journey she would never have a chance to complete. Despite their humble beginnings, Justine's parents worked tirelessly to support her education and livelihood. Justine's parents worked as a gardener and housekeeper, respectively. Justine herself was known for her reliability, hard work, and dedication to her obligations. Given her strong ties to her family and her commitment to her responsibilities, no one believed she would willingly abandon her loved ones. Furthermore, her limited social circle and absence of typical teenage rebellious behavior made the idea of her running away seem implausible. Despite contacting all of Justine's acquaintances, none could provide insight into her whereabouts. At 24, Justine had outgrown any inclination for teenage defiance, remaining a steadfast and devoted member of her family until her sudden disappearance. Hence, the possibility of Justine running away was swiftly dismissed. She maintained an unwavering connection with her parents, updating them on her every move. On the particular day, she and her mother exchanged a staggering 63 messages, the last being at 6.24 p.m. when Justine alighted from the bus. As detectives diligently investigated leads to determine Justine's whereabouts, a crucial tip emerged from her co-workers. Shortly after Justine's bus stop, authorities were notified of a disturbing incident. A female motorist reported witnessing a man forcibly pushing an Asian woman with dark hair, dressed in sportswear similar to Justine's, into the trunk of a black Nissan Qashqai. The woman recounted her harrowing experience, driving past the suspicious scene with her 12-year-old son and promptly alerting the police. Shortly after, another motorist passed by and witnessed a similarly distressing scene. This time, an Asian girl was seen seated in the back of the vehicle, tapping on the window in evident fear. Initially perplexed, the driver later discussed the incident with his wife. Upon returning home and realizing the gravity of the situation, he promptly contacted the authorities at 7.20 p.m. to report the suspected kidnapping. Another concerned driver also contacted the police, citing a suspicious Nissan vehicle driving erratically approximately six kilometers from Enniscary. Patrol officers swiftly responded to the location provided by the initial female caller. There they discovered Justine's broken cell phone and a bag of bread abandoned on the roadside, raising alarming concerns for her safety. Armed with this disturbing evidence, investigators concluded that the kidnapper had targeted Justine as she made her way home from the bus stop. After initial attempts to conceal her in the trunk were thwarted by Justine's resistance, 
the suspect forced her into the back seat before driving off to an unknown destination. The suspect's black Nissan was promptly added to the wanted list, prompting an extensive search effort involving patrol cars and helicopters. However, the night made the search more difficult, resulting in no result. When day broke, the search resumed, with detectives revisiting eyewitness testimonies and narrowing down potential suspects. One individual, 40-year-old Mark Hennessy, emerged as a person of interest due to his resemblance to the kidnapper's description. Police officers visited his residence, only to find his wife Nicola unaware of his whereabouts since he left for a drink after work the previous day. This information only raised more suspicions surrounding Mark, prompting investigators to delve further into his background. Mark Hennessy appeared to be a pillar of the community, widely regarded as a devoted family man, husband, and father to two young daughters, the youngest born just eight months prior. Hailing from a respected family, he resided in an affluent neighborhood alongside other young families. Mark's occupation as an estimator on construction sites provided a stable income for his family, and he boasted a clean record with no prior brushes with the law. Despite his seemingly impeccable reputation, law enforcement remained cognizant of the unsettling reality that individuals may conceal darker motives beneath a veneer of respectability. With this in mind, the police officers visited the bar that Mark had frequented the previous night to gather more information. The staff confirmed his presence, but noted that his stay was brief. He had left after consuming a single beer and watching some soccer. Unimpressed by the excitement of the match, Mark's return to the bar around midnight appeared to be marked by visible agitation and unease. Upon reviewing the bar's CCTV footage, investigators corroborated the staff's accounts, observing that Mark's stay was approximately 10 minutes before he departed at around 5.40 p.m. Engrossed in a phone conversation, he quickly made his way to his car and drove off, concluding his visit around 11.30 p.m. Interestingly, upon leaving the bar, Mark actually returned and engaged in a conversation with an acquaintance at the doorway before leaving once again. Detectives found themselves puzzled by Mark's whereabouts between 5.40 p.m. and 11 p.m., and the nature of his activities during this time remained a mystery. By this point, investigators had acquired CCTV footage from the bus route Justine had taken, and upon examination, a disturbing revelation emerged. Mark's black Nissan had trailed the bus just 30 minutes after he left the bar, shadowing its movements throughout the day. This revelation heightened suspicions surrounding his involvement, especially in relation to Justine's disappearance. The search for Mark's car and the missing girl persisted unabated, with growing certainty that the two incidents were intertwined. Mark emerged as a prime suspect in Justine's abduction, despite efforts to track his cell phone, which intermittently powered on and off, Mark managed to evade detection. He made a solitary call to his wife, informing her of his continued absence. Even when confronted by his own family, who pleaded with him to surrender to the authorities, Mark remained obstinate and promptly departed. Mark's parents relayed this encounter to investigators, prompting renewed efforts to locate him. However, Mark remained elusive, staying a step ahead of law enforcement. In a bid for public assistance, the police issued appeals through the media, urging anyone with knowledge of Justine, Mark, or his car's whereabouts to come forward. One listener heeded this call, spotting a similar Nissan cash car on the road with a familiar looking driver behind the wheel. Sensing an opportunity, she followed the vehicle to Cherrywood Park, where she observed the driver closely before promptly notifying the authorities. Upon arrival, the responding police officers encountered a man seated behind the wheel, his body covered in blood. Despite their attempts to coax him out of the vehicle, Mark remained obstinate, brandishing a knife in a menacing manner. Faced with imminent danger, the officers were compelled to resort to the use of firearms, resulting in a bullet striking Mark in the shoulder. Removing him from the car, they discovered him conscious, though uncooperative. As they commenced their examination of the vehicle, their hopes of locating the missing girl were dashed, as Justine was nowhere to be found. Persistent questioning yielded no answers from Mark, 
who maintained a steadfast silence. Medical personnel promptly attended to him, and he was swiftly transported to the hospital, where doctors battled to save his life, clinging to the hope that he might divulge Justine's whereabouts. Tragically, it was revealed that the bullet had tragically ricocheted, fatally striking Mark in the head. Subsequent investigations unearthed the grim truth. The blood adorning his face and body belonged to him, and he bore several fresh stab wounds on his arm and neck. Law enforcement speculated that, consumed by fear of exposure, Mark had chosen to confront his fate with the knife, conveniently stashed in his vehicle. When the police finally apprehended him, there was a sense of disappointment pervading the air. Despite successfully locating the suspect in his vehicle, their primary objective of finding the missing person remained unfulfilled. However, a note was discovered, its contents obscured by bloodstains. Through the haze of crimson, officers managed to discern the words Sorry and Puck's Castle, hinting at a potential lead to Jastine's whereabouts. Though hope flickered dimly, they persevered in their search, while the anxious parents fervently prayed for their daughter's safe return. A meticulous search unfolded in a wooded expanse south of Dublin, guided by the cryptic clue near the castle. Initially, Justin's purse containing her identification documents was unearthed. Then on May 21st, a grim discovery was made, the lifeless body of Justine Valdez. Autopsy revealed the horrific truth that she had been murdered on the very evening of her abduction, succumbing to manual strangulation. Tragically, evidence of sexual assault further compounded the brutality of her demise. However, amidst the sorrow and despair, another unsettling revelation emerged. Toxicological analysis unveiled the presence of prohibited substances in Justine's body. This posed a puzzling enigma as there was no clear explanation for the origin or purpose of these substances. Conversely, the analysis found that Mark had ingested a significant quantity of these substances, further deepening the mystery surrounding the tragic events. It emerged that Mark had recently spiraled into alcohol and substance abuse, likely contributing to the presence of these substances in Justine's system. Concurrently, his domestic life had deteriorated with frequent spats between him and his spouse over his substance abuse and mounting debts. Investigations revealed Mark's engagement with the dating app Tinder, where he actively pursued interactions with various women, including flirting with female patrons at bars. Further incriminating evidence emerged when Mark's DNA was found on the victim's body, reinforcing the police's suspicions about his involvement in Justin's abduction and subsequent murder. Detectives pieced together a disturbing narrative. The murder was driven by sexual motives, and Justine became an unwitting victim in Mark's sinister pursuit of prey. Spotting her while following a bus, he seized the opportunity in broad daylight, brazenly abducting her from the street without hesitation, even in the presence of multiple witnesses. A thorough examination of the victim's and perpetrator's phones revealed no prior acquaintance or communication between them. Their paths had never crossed before, with no mutual connections to bridge the gap between victim and assailant. This grim revelation underscored the tragic randomness of Justine's fate and the calculated brutality of Mark's actions. Upon closer scrutiny, the detective's initial assessment underwent a significant shift. It transpired that Mark was intimately familiar with the route Justine frequently traversed, suggesting a premeditated nature to her murder. Far from a spur-of-the-moment act, Mark had been meticulously observing her movements, biding his time until he deemed it opportune to strike. The day of the abduction marked a deliberate departure from his usual routine as he purposefully positioned himself at the bus stop, tailing Justine's every move until he pounced on her unsuspecting victim. The revelation sent shockwaves through the local community, unaccustomed to such heinous acts in their otherwise tranquil neighborhood. Many rallied around the grieving family, offering solace and support during their time of immense loss. At the farewell ceremony, poignant tributes were paid as white balloons soared into the sky, symbolizing hope amidst despair. Some attendees donned pink t-shirts emblazoned with Justine's likeness, a touching homage to her memory. Ultimately, 
Justine's family chose to lay her to rest in her native Philippines, seeking solace in familiar surroundings. Though they initially remained abroad for a period, they eventually returned to Ireland in 2021, seeking a fresh start and new opportunities. Relocating to a different city and pursuing new occupations offered a chance to heal from the harrowing memories that haunted them in their former home. Mark Hennessy exhibited the characteristic behavior of a serial sex offender. They concluded that although his crime seemed spontaneous and unplanned, he displayed the traits of someone who had committed such acts multiple times previously. In the early days of the investigation, it emerged that a man matching Hennessy's age and physical description had been harassing female passengers at train stations in South County, Dublin, over several years, including exposing himself to them. However, there is no definitive proof that Hennessy and the serial harasser were the same person. We will likely never know, as Mark Hennessy's secrets died with him. Hello friends, welcome to our channel. Today we're going to take a look at another horrible case with you. Min Lin and Yoon Lee Lin's love story began in the late 1980s during their college years at an Australian university. Both were natives of China who had separately emigrated to Australia to pursue higher education. Yoon Lee through an exchange program and Min, who was two years her senior, remained in the country for a professional internship. They met in a university corridor, which they later recalled as a case of love at first sight. They shared common roots and dreams and both felt like outsiders in a foreign land, but were united by their aspirations to start a new life in Australia. After graduation, the couple married and settled in the picturesque and peaceful suburb of North Epping in Sydney. Their love grew into a large, close-knit family, deeply connected and devoted to one another. In August 1994, they welcomed their first child, a daughter named June Brenda Lynn, who was commonly known by her middle name Brenda. Their son Henry was born in 1997, followed by the youngest, Terry, in 2000. Entering the 2000s, Min and Yoon Lee decided to start a business venture, opening a small newsstand. Their dedication transformed this modest beginning into a thriving news agency with its publishing arm on Rose Street. The Lin family's business prospered, enabling them to enjoy a comfortable lifestyle with a spacious home, a luxury car, and prestigious private schooling for their children. Min focused on business matters, while Yoon Lee dedicated herself to homemaking and nurturing their children. In their community, the Lins were well-respected for their diligence, kindness, and charitable work. They were known as exemplary, caring parents who avoided conflicts. Brenda, their eldest, was exceptionally beautiful and an excellent student with a compassionate nature towards animals. The boys, Henry and Terry, were energetic and sports-loving, sharing a passion for soccer the siblings shared a strong bond and were almost inseparable. As the Lin family settled in Australia and their financial prosperity grew, they began inviting relatives from China to visit, live, or even stay permanently. In the early 2000s, Min's parents were the first to move to North Epping, living nearby and helping with the children. Min's father also worked in their newsstand on weekends. A few years later, Yoon Lee's parents also moved to the Sydney suburb, with Min and Yoon Lee buying them a small house. Yoon Lee's sister, Irene, came to live with the Lins, assisting with household chores and the children. By this time, the Lin family business was generating substantial income, reportedly nearing $1 million annually. Their venture wasn't just a shop or publishing house. It had become a local hub where people gathered to read and discuss news over coffee. Towards the end of 2007, Min Lin's younger sister, Kathy Lin Nye, and her husband, Lian Bin Robert Robert, also moved to Australia, seeking better opportunities in the bustling city of Sydney. They had visited relatives in Australia before and briefly lived in Melbourne, but this time they were determined to settle in Australia permanently. Robert, a former successful ENT doctor in China, decided to switch careers and try entrepreneurship. The Lins opened their own restaurant in Sydney, investing all their savings, but the business struggled and soon closed. Subsequent attempts to open a cafe or snack bar also failed, 
as Robert lacked business acumen and financial management skills. Eventually, Robert and Kathy moved to North Epping, closer to family. The Lynn and Robert families were bound not only by kinship, but also by strong friendship. They saw each other almost daily, stayed in constant touch, and often gathered for family meals. Their last such gathering was on the evening of Friday, July 17, 2009, at the home of Kathy and Min's parents. Unbeknownst to them, this would be their final reunion. The Lynn family home was the scene of a gruesome massacre on the morning of July 18th. The Lynn family's shop remained unexpectedly closed, surprising their regular customers. The shop, which had operated seven days a week for years, showed no signs of opening, with no notice or warning on the doors. This unusual occurrence raised concerns among the customers and neighboring shop owners. One of them, after several unsuccessful attempts to reach Min, called his sister Kathy to inquire about the situation. Kathy was both surprised and alarmed, knowing her brother had never closed the shop for a day without prior arrangements often having their father or father-in-law cover for him. She tried calling Min and then his wife, Yun Li, but to no avail, as her calls to their home phone also went unanswered. Worried, Kathy and her husband, Robert, decided to visit Min's house to ensure everything was all right. Arriving around 9 a.m., they noticed the family car in the driveway and found the front door unlocked, but no sign of the homeowners. The house was eerily quiet, and calls for the family members went unanswered. The house appeared undisturbed with no signs of forced entry. Kathy, repeatedly calling out for her brother, ascended to the second floor. Upon opening the bedroom door of Min and Yun Li Lin, she screamed in shock and horror, staggering back at the gruesome scene before her. The room was completely covered in blood across the floor, walls, ceiling, furniture, and curtains. The lifeless body of 43-year-old Yunli Lin lay near the bed, mutilated beyond immediate recognition. In the adjacent room where 39-year-old Irene, Yunli's sister, slept, the scene was equally ghastly. Irene lay dead in her bed, her face a bloody pulp. In the children's bedrooms, 12-year-old Henry and 9-year-old Terry had also been brutally beaten to death, their bodies lying in different corners of the room. Brenda, the 15-year-old daughter, had fortunately been away on a school trip the previous day and was not at home during the tragic night. The body of Min Lin was nowhere to be found, leading to a faint hope that he might be alive, possibly injured, taken hostage, or escaped. Kathy immediately called emergency services, but she was so hysterical from the shock that she struggled to convey what had happened. She screamed and cried into the phone, begging for medics to arrive quickly and try to save anyone they could. However, the first responders could only confirm the deaths of all the victims at the scene of the massacre. The morning after, a chilling discovery followed Kathy's frantic call to emergency services. Robert left to fetch the Lynn parents, who lived about 10 kilometers away from the crime scene. The police and paramedics arrived within minutes, and what they encountered was immediately dubbed as one of the most horrific crime scenes they had ever witnessed. Tragically, it was too late for any member of the Lin family. Each had been killed by multiple blows to the head with a heavy blunt object resembling a hammer. However, the lethal weapon was nowhere to be found, leading investigators to conclude that the perpetrator had taken it with them. Min Lin's body was eventually discovered in his own bedroom covered with a blood-soaked blanket. Like his family, he had been beaten to death in a similar manner. It appeared that he was the first victim, followed by his wife, her sister, and lastly the two boys. An initial inspection of the crime scene did not yield any significant clues or leads. The absence of the lethal weapon, combined with the fact that valuables and money were left untouched, indicated that the primary objective was the elimination of the Lin family rather than robbery. Initially, multiple assailants were suspected, as it seemed unlikely that one person could single-handedly overpower so many. However, evidence suggested that the children were awake and had desperately tried to escape during the attack, as indicated by blood stains and splatters throughout the house. Interestingly, all adult victims besides head injuries also showed signs of strangulation 
possibly to minimize resistance during the assault. Identical bloody shoe prints were found in each room with a unique tread pattern, but the shoe brand could not be identified, only its size. No fingerprints were discovered, suggesting that the killer or killers wore gloves. At first, there were no leads or theories about the identity of the perpetrator, as family friends and neighbors unanimously stated that the Lins had no known enemies. The motive for such a brutal massacre of five people remained unclear. The time of the attack was established to be between midnight and 3 a.m. on July 18th. Brenda Lynn, the eldest and now the sole survivor of the extensive Lynn family, was on a school trip to New Caledonia at the time of the tragedy. She first learned of the horrific incident through social media and initially refused to believe that it involved her own family, hoping for some mistake. Her Aunt Kathy soon called her confirming the dreadful news through tearful sobs. Brenda was quickly flown back to Sydney, where Kathy and Robert, her new guardians, met her at the airport. Brenda moved in with them as the Lynn family home was sealed as a crime scene. The next day, a grief-stricken Brenda was brought to the police station for questioning. However, she could offer no new information, insisting that her family had no enemies or ill-wishers and had noticed nothing unusual before her trip. Following her family's death, Brenda became the heir to a substantial fortune, including property in the family business. However, being a minor and still in school, her legal guardians, Aunt Kathy and her husband Robert, were responsible for managing the estate. Brenda's grandparents also offered their support, but Kathy and Robert insisted on being her primary caretakers. Robert even threatened legal action if the elderly relatives sought custody arguing they were too old to care for a teenager. Eventually, the matter was settled amicably and Brenda remained with her aunt and uncle. The Lynn's shop and publishing business, which had been temporarily closed, soon reopened under the management of the deceased, as Brenda was yet to take over the business operations. Robert also began actively reviewing the family's bank accounts, savings, real estate, and other assets. Investigation and theories experts repeatedly scrutinized the crime scene meticulously, documenting every detail. Despite their efforts, no concrete leads emerged. They deduced that the killer likely acted alone and entered the house quietly, suggesting either an unlocked door or the perpetrator having a key. The killer wore size 9.5 shoes with a distinct ornate tread pattern. The lethal weapon, believed to be a hammer, was never found in or around the house. The killer's use of gloves meant no fingerprints were left behind, and no foreign DNA was found, only traces from the five victims. A peculiar and significant detail was that blood stains were found on the doorknobs of each bedroom where the perpetrators occurred, indicating the killer's bloodied gloves touched them. However, there were no blood stains on the doorknob of Brenda's room, suggesting the killer knew she was not there. As one of Australia's most high-profile cases, the tragic incident was widely covered in the media, with no substantial evidence or suspects. Various improbable theories emerged, including rumors about the Lynn's alleged vast fortune leading to their demise, a robbery gone wrong, and even involvement of local Chinese mafia clans. These theories weren't entirely dismissed, given the area's history with a burglary gang, as the Lynn shop had been attacked months before the tragedy and men had witnessed an armored car robbery a week before the fatal incidents, although the criminals wore masks and the men couldn't identify them. It was speculated that the perpetrator might have been eliminated as a potential witness. Months passed with the investigation at a standstill. None of the theories were substantiated and no suspects emerged. The robbery theory was eventually ruled out as money and valuables were untouched and the killer seemed to have a different motive, singular purpose to eliminate the household members. Additionally, the power was cut off in the house on the night of the fatal incidents, indicating the killer knew where the electrical panel was, as their familiarity with the house in total darkness suggested they had been there before and knew the layout, possibly even obtaining a key in advance, a crucial overlooked clue. While reviewing the perplexing case details, an investigator repeatedly listened to Kathy's emergency call, searching for any overlooked clue. 
Surprisingly, a significant hint was found in that recording. The recording captured Kathy's hysterical attempts to explain the situation, her words jumbled and interrupted by cries and sobs. At the end of the call, when the operator confirmed that emergency services were on their way, Kathy unexpectedly mentioned her husband's name, adding something in Cantonese, directly addressing him. This detail piqued the investigator's interest, prompting them to translate her words. It turned out Kathy was pleading with her husband not to leave her alone in the house. This was significant because Robert had decided to fetch the Lynn parents on his own, leaving Kathy at the gruesome crime scene before the police arrived. Robert's behavior seemed highly suspicious, as five people had just been brutally taken away from the house, and the killer could still have been hiding inside, making Kathy a potential target. Yet Robert appeared calm and simply left as if he knew nothing bad would happen to his wife. After several unproductive months, the police finally identified a primary and sole suspect, Robert. It was discovered that he had a key to his brother-in-law's house, which his in-laws had given him just in case shortly before the tragedy. Curiously, Robert never mentioned this during interrogations, and Kathy was unaware that her brother had given her husband a key. Brenda unknowingly revealed this crucial detail to the investigators. Further investigation revealed that Robert's claim of being a successful ENT doctor was a facade. While he did possess a medical degree, he never held a stable job in the field. Rumors suggested he fled to Australia to avoid punishment for alleged bribery charges in China. In Australia, Robert failed to establish himself professionally, squandering the last of his savings on unsuccessful business ventures. After moving to North Keeping, he became essentially idle relying on his wife's income and occasional financial assistance from Kathy's relatives. Once the guardianship papers for Brenda were finalized, Robert acted as if he had inherited the Lynn family's estate. His first move was to force Lynn's parents out of the house that Min had bought for them, though it was legally under the deceased name. Even though Men and Kathy's parents remained in the house bought for them, considering these facts and circumstances, Investigators theorized that Robert was driven by intense envy of his wife's more successful and wealthy relatives, harboring a long-standing plan to seize their property, money, and lucrative business. Despite living under the same roof as the perpetrator of the crime against her family, Brenda and Kathy weren't considered in immediate danger. Brenda was oblivious to the true nature of her cohabitant while Kathy was needed by Robert to maintain control over the family's assets. However, the police couldn't arrest Robert yet due to lack of concrete evidence against him. Interrogation surveillance and arrest the investigation team obtained permission to install several hidden cameras in the Robert household, hoping to gather the evidence needed to prove Robert's guilt. The breakthrough came sooner than expected starting with an unsuspecting revelation by Kathy during an interrogation. Kathy mentioned her husband's preference for a particular brand of shoes a few years back. Robert had purchased two pairs of sneakers from a limited edition series that he particularly liked. He had worn out and discarded one pair, but the other was still carefully stored in its box at their home. Notably, Robert wore size 9.5 shoes the same size as the killer's. The key evidence came when Robert was captured on one of the hidden cameras, meticulously destroying the box of the aforementioned shoes. This footage led to a warrant to search the suspect's home, where a new pair of size 9.5 sneakers was found. The tread pattern on these shoes matched the prints found at the crime scene. Additionally, a small smeared trace resembling blood was discovered in his garage. Forensic analysis confirmed that it was indeed a blood stain containing the DNA of all five Lin family victims, literally linking it to the crime scene. This evidence led to Robert's arrest, finally providing the concrete proof the police needed to take action. During the trial, shocking revelations emerged. Robert vehemently denied any involvement claiming the blood found in his garage appeared after their return from the Lynn house. He also dismissed the significance of the sneakers with matching tread patterns found in his possession, asserting they were brand new and that he had immediately disposed of the old pair. 
While awaiting trial in prison for three years, Robert unknowingly shared cells with several informants. In one such conversation, he confessed to meticulously planning the crime and carefully covering his tracks. He mentioned buying the lethal weapon in a remote store without surveillance cameras and drugging his wife with sedatives in tea to prevent her from waking up and noticing his absence. He disposed of the hammer, sneakers, gloves, and clothing in a manner that ensured they would never be found. At the trial, Robert denied everything, and the only evidence against him were the statements from his cellmates and the previously mentioned indirect evidence. As a result, the jury couldn't reach a unanimous verdict, and Robert was released on bail in December 2015. The trial resumed in June 2016 with testimony from another informant who claimed Robert confessed to an obsession with Brenda since she was 13. This led to a re-examination of Brenda, who tearfully admitted that Robert had coerced her into a sexual relationship shortly after she started living with them. Fearing retaliation, she had remained silent about the abuse for years. With these revelations and considering other evidence, Robert Robert was found guilty on all charges. He received five life sentences, one for each fatal crime without the possibility of parole. All his subsequent appeals were rejected. Hello friends, welcome to our channel. Today, we're going to take a look at another horrible case with you. The case of Vera Pektaleva. Vera Pektaleva was born on September 24, 1997 in Kelos, Kovo Oblast. As she grew up, she became a cheerful and creative individual. With a passion for singing, she secured first place in various school competitions. Although her parents, Oksana and Yvan, divorced during her school years, they remained on good terms. Vera maintained a positive relationship with both her father's new wife and her mother's new husband. Those who knew her described Vera as a kind, optimistic, and non-confrontational person. As mentioned earlier, Vera was a creative individual, and her family was taken aback when, after completing high school, she opted to move to Kovo and pursue a technical education at the State University rather than following a more artistic route. Her mother, Oksana, resided in Kisilov, which was approximately 110 miles away from Kovo, and Vera would visit her during her spare time. During one of her visits in 2016, Vera encountered Vladislav Kanyus, a young man of her age. Unlike Vera, Vlad, as he was commonly known, was a complete contrast. He did not have life goals, was introverted, and had a quick temper. Having dropped out of school after the ninth grade, Vlad grew up in a troubled home. After his mother abandoned the family, he was left to live with his father. Unfortunately, his life was filled with more challenges. His father had frequent run-ins with the law, which ultimately culminated in him taking his own life in front of Vlad, leaving an indelible mark on him. Vera fell in love with Vlad despite having little in common with him. However, her parents were against their relationship, knowing Vlad's troubled past. Vera's father discovered her relationship with Vlad, and he asked her to end it. Instead of breaking up with Vlad, Vera just stopped discussing him with her parents. Vlad was never present at family gatherings, and his pictures were not posted on Vera's social media. It seemed as though Vera was keeping him a secret, according to Oksana, Vera's mother. One important detail is worth noting. In 2019, Vera and Vlad began cohabiting in Kovo. Vera's parents financially assisted with the apartment, and Vlad, who was unemployed by choice, thoroughly enjoyed living with Vera, who was not only beautiful and intelligent, but also financially secure. She consistently had money and supported him. However, their relationship was strained. Vlad struggled with alcohol addiction and showed no inclination to seek help or change his behavior. Her parents were convinced that Vlad was abusive to her. After years of suffering, Vera made the brave decision to end the toxic relationship in November 2019. However, Vlad refused to accept this and disputed her choice. As her parents had financially supported the couple's apartment, Vera reasonably expected Vlad to vacate the premises. But Vlad was unwilling to give up the benefits of living off someone else's generosity. Now here's an excerpt from Vlad's testimony. 
it will give you a more accurate idea of what happened after Vera decided to end her relationship with him. But remember, this is Vlad's testimony, so it's up to you whether you believe his words. On December 15, 2019, a fight broke out between him and Vera over his desire to visit a nightclub, which she opposed. This was not their first disagreement. Throughout their relationship, Vera had been frequently visiting Celos and drifting away from him. She even confessed to speaking with another person. In fact, she had ended her relationship with Vlad a month prior. He later discovered from a mutual friend that she was involved with Alexander, a resident of Celos. Although he had never met Alexander, when he confronted Vera, she acknowledged the relationship. At the time, they continued to cohabitate, but following their December 15 altercation, she left, taking some belongings with her. Despite their separation, they remained in contact by phone, and on January 12, 2020, he offered to assist her in relocating her remaining belongings to a new apartment. She agreed to meet him, and they scheduled a time for January 13. They met in the afternoon, packed up both her belongings and his, since he too wanted to move out, and drank beer, lure, and vodka. They got drunk, but there was no conflict until he brought up the topic of their relationship and revealed that he knew about Alexander. She became enraged, swearing at him, insulting him, and starting to physically assault him, kicking him at least five times in the groin area and slapping him in the face at least eight times. He only felt pain from the kicks, not the slaps. Vera instigated the physical fight, which made him angry because she had lied about not seeing another guy and was upset that he knew about her personal life. That was the testimony that Vlad told the police. Next, we'll discuss the other side of this story, which gives every reason to believe that Vlad was not honest in his testimony. Vera sent a voice message to her friend at 5.08 p.m. In the message, she mentioned that she was already at the apartment, packing her belongings. She expected to be settled into her new apartment around 6 p.m. and requested her friend's help to move her things from the taxi to the apartment. Just three minutes later, Vera sent a new voice message. She invited her friend to come to the apartment where she lived with Vlad and help her with the move. However, Vera did not have time to finish as Vlad intervened by saying, no, no one's coming in here so he was against Vera's friend coming to the apartment. It seems that the situation began to get out of control because four minutes later, at 5.15 p.m., Vera, in a low voice, asked her friend to come. It looks like this message was a call for help. She deliberately spoke in a low voice so that Vlad wouldn't hear her. At 5.25 p.m., Vera sends another voice message and Vlad's dominant voice is heard again. He tells Vera's friend not to bother them and to wait for Vera to text her. At 7.19 p.m., Vlad recorded the voice message himself. From that moment on, Vera did not have access to her phone. She was left alone with the monster. But what happened next needs to be explained. At about 3 a.m., the neighbors from the same floor started waking up from the terrible screams coming from apartment 738. A witness called what was happening a massacre. The screams were so loud that 15 people gathered in the hallway near the apartment. Vlad's brother was among them, and he remembered Vlad's words and realized they needed to break down the door, since his brother had previously said that he would take Vera's life. The door to the apartment was made of iron, so the neighbors started looking for tools to force it open. All this time, Vera's heart-rending cries were coming from the apartment. People called the emergency service, and these calls eventually became part of a separate investigation. For 30 minutes, the police still weren't at the scene. It lasted until 6.30 a.m. During these three and a half hours, people called the police, but no one came to Vera's aid. The witnesses made seven calls to the emergency service while Vera was fighting for her life but no one came. The last words they heard from behind the door were Vlad's. He said, Vera, forgive me. I love you very much. In the end, the neighbors found a crowbar in a nearby parking lot and broke down the door. By this time, Vera was already dead, 
and Vlad was in the bathroom. He was very drunk. While Vera was painfully dying at the hands of her former boyfriend, and the neighbors were trying in vain to get help from the police, the 112 operators were talking about life, laughing, drinking tea, and were very unhappy that they were being disturbed. The police arrived only after it became known that Vera had died. Later, they will claim that there was no gas in one car and that there were no available officers as everyone was busy with other calls. As a result, the 112 operators and the police officers on duty that night were on trial too. The video from the police station was published during the investigation, but there is no point in translating it into English. I can describe it in just one word, indifference, and it is clear even without subtitles. But Vlad claimed there were no conflicts between him and Vera until 5 a.m. However, the forensic examination showed that he lied. Vera received her first injury six hours before her death, that is, at about midnight. It meant that Vlad Kanyus was beating and injuring her for six hours until she took her last breath. Her body bore around 100 injuries, including stab wounds, a broken nose, and broken ribs. Strangulation marks were also visible on her neck. If the police's inaction shocked you, then be prepared for what comes next, which will be just as astonishing. More than a thousand people gathered for Vera Pektaleva's funeral. The church could not accommodate everyone. According to Oksana, Vera's mother, the funeral home spent four hours trying to restore Vera's face with makeup, but she still could not recognize her daughter. That's how serious her injuries were. Meanwhile, Vlad Kanyus was telling the investigators his version of what happened. He, of course, tried to downplay his role in this crime. He said about that night, that when he started talking to her about our relationship, he suggested they should get back together and told her that he knew she was seeing another guy. A conflict between them started. She didn't like it. After that, she started swearing, insulting him, and hitting him. Namely, she kicked him at least five times in the groin area and hit him in the face at least eight times with her palm. He didn't feel any pain when she slapped him. However, when she kicked him between the legs, he experienced physical pain. That is, Vera started hitting him first. It made him angry. He was angry that she lied and said she wasn't dating another guy. At the same time, Vera said that he was prying into her personal life because he knew everything about her. During this time, she continued to insult him, and he got angry and hit her several times with his palms, about four times on the head, but the blows were of small force. When he hit Vera, she fell to the floor, hitting the closet. She was lying on her stomach. She also hit him back. Namely, she beat his head with her palms and fists. It was painful. He asked her to stop, but she didn't stop. He remembered she scratched his back. Then he decided to take her by the neck. He saw an iron that was on the floor. He took this iron and wrapped the iron cord around Vera's neck. After that, he tightened the cord around her neck slightly. He squeezed her neck for a minute and a half or two. At that moment, he didn't realize that he could kill Vera with his actions. He didn't want to kill Vera. He was tightening the cord around Vera's neck because he wanted to scare her. He wanted her to lose consciousness. He wanted her to fall asleep for 15 minutes. After he removed the cord from her neck, she started making sounds, coughing, or wheezing. When he removed the cord from Vera's neck, she was in a prone position, but then he put her on her back. At that moment, she was unconscious. At the same time, she made sounds, that is, wheezed. He thought she was fine. After a while, he started waking Vera up, but she was unresponsive. Then, he started listening to whether her heart was beating. He put his ear to her mouth, then to her heart. She had no pulse, she wasn't breathing. He don't remember what happened next. He remember that at some point, he ended up in the bathroom. At the same time, he had a knife in his hands. He took a knife with me because he wanted to hurt myself. He didn't want to live because he realized that Vera was dead. He didn't want to kill her. After some time, the door to the apartment opened and his brother and a police officer were inside. After that, he was told to get dressed. He was taken to the police station. He'm sorry for what he did. 
He do not deny that it was his actions that caused Vera's death. He didn't want to kill her. He want to apologize to Vera's family. As you have noticed, Vlad has a selective memory. He remembered strangling Vera, but did not remember how he inflicted about a hundred injuries on her. It was also unclear how Vera could have punched him in the face and scratched his back while she was lying on her stomach on the floor. During the interrogation, it also became clear how Vlad's brother ended up at the crime scene. After all, he lived in another city. Here's what Vlad told the police about it. He called his brother. He told him about what happened. He told him that Vera wasn't breathing and his brother told me to call an ambulance and give her CPR. He tried to give her first aid. He tried to give her CPR and cardiac massage. During the investigation, it became known that he called his brother at about midnight and said that he was going to take Vera's life. At the second interrogation, when asked again about the injuries on Vera's body, he replied, it was probably me who caused those injuries to Vera. He did not count the number of his blows, but these injuries that were found on Vera's body by the expert may have been caused by me. He don't remember how many times he hit her, but he think it's the same number as indicated by the expert. He admit he caused her all the injuries indicated in the report. He wanted silence. He didn't think about her suffering. She screamed and insulted him during their conflict. He didn't enjoy hitting her, but he didn't like her screaming. He wanted her to shut up. He didn't think about her suffering at that time. Vlad Kanyus also said he had consensual intimate relations with Vera that evening. The related charges were eventually dropped. It was difficult to prove the opposite. Police officers and emergency service operators were charged with negligence. It's hard to believe, but they were not suspended from work during the investigation and continued to provide ridiculous justifications. The prosecutor demanded real prison terms for all five defendants, but the judge decided otherwise. They received suspended sentences ranging from 1.5 to 2 years. The court also ordered each defendant to pay around $350 to the victims. Simultaneously, the police department had to pay approximately $111,000. The amounts have been converted from the Russian ruble to US dollars for easier understanding. The indictment states that the police officers had access to gasoline and should have taken appropriate measures to resolve the situation, but they did not consider it an urgent task. Both police officers refused to cooperate with the investigation and did not admit guilt. They claimed that when witnesses reported the woman's screams and cries for help, the investigation team was at another address where a man's corpse had been found. We may never know the full truth of what happened that night. Vera was not planning to stay in the apartment and had asked her friend for help with moving, suggesting that Vlad Kanyus may have forced her to consume alcohol when she was unconscious, then fabricated a story to make the event seem unintentional. In the summer of 2022, the court sentenced Vlad Kanyus to 17 years in prison, and he partially admitted his guilt. He was also ordered to pay around $45,000 in compensation. However, this verdict shocked Vera's parents, who planned to appeal, believing the punishment was too lenient. Surprisingly, Vlad Kanyus did not even serve a full year in prison. In November 2023, photos of him in military uniform appeared online, and in April 2023, it became known that he had received a presidential pardon after six months of participation in the ongoing armed conflict in Russia. He was also relieved of the obligation to pay any compensation to Vera's parents. Vera's case has caused widespread resonance in Russia, and the news about Vlad Kanyos's pardon has been equally controversial. The press secretary of the Russian president stated that there are specific procedures for granting pardons, including a confession of guilt by the convict and the possibility of redeeming oneself on the battlefield. Lisa Maria Kaiza was born in 1994 in a large family where her eight siblings also grew up. It was a large but far from prosperous family. Parents were busy with their own problems and did not show love and care towards their children. 
Moreover, there were rumors that abuse and violence were rampant in the family. The story in question unfolded in the year 2020, at the very time when the whole world was consumed with the fight against COVID-19. In one corner of Ecuador, quietly and unnoticed, truly terrible events were unfolding. Here, in the small parish of Pifo, on the northeastern outskirts of Quito, the protagonist of this tragic story was born and raised. Lisa Maria Kaiza, a woman with an enigmatic gaze whose life story became a true Ecuadorian nightmare. On that unfortunate Tuesday, October 27, 2020, Lisa sent several messages to the father of her children, David. They were words full of despair because their paths with David at that time had already almost parted. In these lines, she confessed her love for him and her unexpected new pregnancy. However, in subsequent messages, Lissa wrote that life was losing its meaning for her, and the decision to terminate the pregnancy was inevitable. Throughout the night, Lissa pleaded with David to come to her, but his refusal was resolute. His parents also urged him to stay home, and David took their advice. In the early morning hours of October 28th, neighbors in Lissa's home heard a faint cry for help. Looking out the window, they found a woman lying on the floor with signs of vomiting. The neighbors rushed to help her, immediately calling emergency services. The doctors and police arrived and found Lissa in a critical condition, but still alive. After administering first aid, she was immediately hospitalized. However, in the house, her children, a girl of five and a boy of nine, were found unconscious. The doctors were unable to help them. Their little hearts had stopped beating at that point. Authorities learned the identity of the children's father and contacted David Acosta, who upon learning of the tragedy, immediately arrived on the scene accompanied by his father. He was informed that Lissa was in the hospital and his children were found without signs of life. After several days of fighting for life in the hospital, Lissa finally regained consciousness. By that time, the investigators guided by their findings, had presented the prosecutor's office with sufficiently convincing arguments to issue an arrest warrant for this mysterious woman. When she was released from the hospital, she was immediately transferred to a social rehabilitation center. The authorities insisted that Lissa undergo a psychological and psychiatric evaluation as her state of mind required further investigation as part of the upcoming trial. Lissa ended up in a rehabilitation center and doctors and psychologists took up their work. In a conversation with a criminal psychologist, Lissa opened up about her difficult childhood where her parents fought and abused each other and their children. Her childhood had a noticeable impact on her state of mind and moments of quarrels and her parents' divorce became an integral part of her memories. Such a childhood forced Lissa to go to work from the age of 11 to be able to study. The girl strived to escape from her dysfunctional family and build her future in a different way. The expert report also indicated that Lissa had been abused. She talked about how, after several years of marriage, David, her husband, changed dramatically. He began to humiliate his spouse and then to raise his hand against her. On the day of the tragedy with the children, investigators working at the scene found several glasses with liquid residue on the table. These finds later revealed traces of epilepsy pills belonging to one of the children, as well as other chemicals requiring identification. Police officers thoroughly searched the house, and after noticing a strange odor in the kitchen, noticed a suspicious area under the utility room. They broke down the barrier and found a lifeless body wrapped in a blanket with characteristic signs of having been there for a long time. Later, Further investigation revealed that the discovered body belonged to Jaime Yanchaguano, a 28-year-old who had been in contact with Lisa. Jaime had been reported missing by his family days before the gruesome discovery. According to Rosa Yanchaguano, Jaime's sister, he was last seen on October 18th. Rosa told investigators that after her brother disappeared, Lisa called several times inquiring about him. Lisa claimed to have received a text message from Jaime where he mentioned that illegal substance traffickers were holding him captive and demanding a ransom of $8,000. She strongly warned Jaime's family not to contact the police. This claim became a crucial point in a complex investigation, as detectives sought to solve the tragedy and uncover if there were any other hidden victims. 
During her interrogation, Lisa revealed that in 2020, while working at a cookie factory, she met Jaime Ian Chiguano. According to her, they became friends. Lisa wanted to return to her husband, who allegedly planned to blackmail Jaime for money. David made it clear to Lisa that if she did not help him, he would divorce her. Later, David gave Lisa a white powder and told her to put it in Jaime's food. Once she did, Jaime fell asleep and never woke up. Realizing what had happened, Lisa, in desperation, tried to win back her husband but failed. In her despair, she ingested the same poison and gave it to her children. However, the poison did not have the expected effect on her, and she sought help from her neighbors to save herself from the horror that had befallen her children. Following her testimony, investigators launched a thorough investigation, but no evidence of David's involvement was found. No one close to the couple could have foreseen that Lisa Maria and David Acosta's lives would take such a tragic turn. When they met, Lisa was only 16 years old and still in high school, a dreamy and romantic girl, while David was a strong and determined young man. Their friendship quickly developed into strong feelings, leading to Lisa's unexpected pregnancy. Although their families disapproved of their relationship, David's parents supported their son and welcomed Lisa into their home. In difficult times, David's family provided genuine support to the young couple, even inviting Lisa to live with them to ensure she completed high school. When Lisa turned 18, the couple got married. Two years later, they were expecting their second child, a daughter. David's parents decided to provide the young couple with their own home, giving them an apartment where they found a corner of family happiness. However, over time, their relationship began to deteriorate. Both spouses were unfaithful, leading to mistrust and disappointment their once boundless love began to weaken. Lisa also complained of psychological abuse from David, prompting her to seek help from the police. Eventually, she was granted a protective order, forcing David to leave the family home. At this point, Lisa began to blackmail David, demanding money for the chance to see their children. In early September 2020, Lisa's life took an unexpected turn when her eldest son began suffering from seizures. In desperation, she took him to the emergency room at Baca Ortiz Hospital. After stabilizing his condition, doctors conducted tests and diagnosed a focal form of epilepsy, a severe condition affecting a specific part of the brain. Doctors advised Lisa to undergo further tests, including MRIs, and to consult specialists urgently. However, Lisa ignored these recommendations. A month later, her son suffered another seizure and they returned to the emergency room. Reviewing his medical history, doctors discovered Lisa had not followed their earlier advice, failed to complete tests, and had not seen specialists, leaving her son without necessary treatment. They warned her that continued neglect could lead to legal consequences. Despite the warnings, Lisa disregarded the medical advice. A few weeks later, after her son's condition resurfaced, she called David, who was alarmed by her serious tone. She informed him that a social worker would visit to discuss their son's diagnosis and treatment. On the day of the appointment, David arrived, but the social worker had already left. To brighten the waiting time, Lissa offered him a drink. However, as David drank the drink, he suddenly felt unwell. His condition was worsening, and the social worker had not shown up. So David decided to go home to get something to deal with his discomfort. The next morning, David woke up in a terrible state. He could barely speak because his tongue was numb. Every step caused discomfort and his eyes hurt. His parents insisted on calling an ambulance. David was taken to the hospital where he spent several days. Tests revealed the presence of a psychoactive substance in his system. But given that he hadn't used anything of the sort, David began to speculate how this could have happened. Eventually, he speculated that perhaps someone had deliberately slipped him some substance in a public place. David was grateful for his life and realized that what had happened could have ended much worse. In early October 2020, Lissa made the decision to hire a nanny for her children. Her cousin Patricia recommended her friend Bertha, a responsible 48-year-old woman looking for work. On Monday, October 5th, Bertha arrived at the young mother's house. 
Lissa urged her to take a pill that she said helped prevent infection with the COVID-19 virus, an epidemic of which was at its height at the time. Claiming that it was a highly effective natural remedy, Lissa convinced Berta to swallow the medicine and enter the house. They sat down to discuss the babysitter's childcare duties. A few minutes later, Bertha began to feel sick. She felt a headache. Her stomach began to upset, and eventually she vomited. A short while later, Patricia showed up. It turned out that she had called her cousin repeatedly, but Lissa didn't answer, which alerted Patricia. She decided to check what had happened and immediately went to her house. Upon entering, she found Berta lying on the couch, who was practically fainting already. Lissa shared with her cousin what had happened and expressed concern. Learning that Lissa still had not called an ambulance, Patricia immediately did so herself. After a while, doctors arrived and sent Berta to the hospital. The condition of the victim managed to stabilize. Doctors diagnosed poisoning with a toxic substance, which often happens when using various medications. Doctors decided that Bertha did not tolerate some component of the composition of the pills from COVID-19. A few months before this tragic incident, in June of the same year, Lissa's former buddy, Mark Escanto, had died of poisoning. At the time, the cause of his death had gone unnoticed. But now, given all these strange circumstances, Mark's case required additional attention. Investigators scrutinized the deceased's home and found Lissa's fingerprints on the glasses used the night before Mark's death. This fact added new evidence to the investigation, pointing to Lissa's possible involvement in the incident. But suddenly, a new accusation was made against Lissa. Her own family made a shocking report to the police. It turns out that on September 2nd, the family had a family gathering where Lissa offered to let everyone taste a drink of her own making. Seven brothers and sisters of the young woman, as well as their parents, drank the unknown drink and immediately felt sick. Fortunately, no one died, but the 56-year-old mother suffered a stroke. Lissa's father claimed that while the relatives were seeking medical attention, his daughter stole $1,300 from the house. Now the investigation included not only crimes against the children and a former boyfriend, but also an incident that jeopardized the lives and health of her own family members. As it turned out, that wasn't all. Investigators encountered another strange event. In May of that year, Jose Luis Erazo, a friend of Lissa's, was found dead in his home. A few days before, Jose had suddenly disappeared, and neighbors soon smelled a rotting odor, prompting them to contact the authorities. An examination of the body initially revealed nothing suspicious and was ruled a heart attack. But one of Jose's sisters suspected something strange and hid a bottle of alcohol found in the refrigerator. In addition, Jose's family noticed that some items were missing from the house. It turned out that Lissa and Jose were friends, and when the guy died, the alleged killer contacted his relatives by phone. With a distraught voice, she stated that Jose owed her a large sum of money, and she had to contact the family to repay the debt. This cunning plan did not work, and a little later Lissa called Jose's family again, changing her voice to conceal her identity. Identifying herself as Jose's friend, she claimed that she was pregnant by him and now had to apply for child support. Although Jose's family did not believe these stories, Lisa was not about to give up and made a third attempt to deceive them. She said she knew who was responsible for Jose's death and offered to meet to uncover the details. Had she not been arrested on charges of killing her own children in Jaime, the list of victims might have gotten longer. When the media reported the arrest of Lisa, who had poisoned three people, Jose's relatives understood. They immediately reported their suspicions to the authorities, and Jose's body was exhumed for forensic examination to determine the true cause of death. The relatives were not mistaken. Traces of poison were found in the remains of the deceased. On December 22, 2020, a hearing was held for Lisa Maria Kaiser for the murder of her two children, whose names and photos were classified, and for Jaime Yanchaguano. The trial was conducted virtually due to restrictions related to the spread of the COVID-19 virus. Lissa had been in contact from a social rehabilitation center. The prosecutor's statement said that Lissa gave her children a toxic mixture of insecticides and anti-epileptic drugs. In interrogations, she claimed that she had grown desperate and could not leave her children with her husband, David, who did not care for the children. 
In fact, she admitted that she wished them dead. At the end of the hearing, the judge issued the defendant a court pass and ordered her remanded into custody pending trial. The children's trial next took place in 2021 at the Pichincha Provincial Court. The prosecutor presented a set of evidence to prove Lissa's guilt. Among them were statements by David, who revealed the content of messages the wife had received on the eve of the tragedy. In one of the messages, she claimed that she would take with her what belonged to her, referring to the children. She said she didn't know where her children and herself would go, heaven or hell. But now she felt as if she was in hell. Lissa added that she doesn't expect her husband to forgive her because she knows he hated her, and now he will hate her even more. David also spoke about his unstable relationship with his wife. At the hearing, the defendant's reconstructed testimony was presented, stating that she took two pills that day, called for help, and then passed out. According to the reconstruction conducted by the prosecutor's office, the daughter died while still in bed, and her older brother tried to take a few steps to call for help, but fell and died. The conclusion of the forensic medical examination was extremely clear. The children died as a result of a premeditated crime. The deaths were the result of suffocation caused by pulmonary edema, an intoxication caused by a mixture of epilepsy medication and other unspecified substances, presumably insecticides and disinfectant. The prosecution also charged Lissa with the death of Jamie Ianchiguano, whose body was found bricked up in the kitchen. The perpetrator was also suspected of attempting to kill David and members of her own family. The hearing raised the issue of Lissa's irresponsible attitude to her son's health after being diagnosed with localized epilepsy. The mother ignored instructions for further tests and follow-up examinations, and when the boy was hospitalized again, his condition was exacerbated by her own mother's negligence. Warnings from medical professionals did not change her attitude toward her son's treatment, leading to a threatened termination of her parental rights. Lissa's mental health investigations revealed her to be highly emotional and environmentally dependent. She sought constant attention and understanding from others and experienced severe anxiety when events did not unfold according to her plan. She also exhibited a tendency to self-harm. She attempted to say goodbye to her life at least three times, but was unsuccessful each time. Witnesses described her as insecure, attachment-seeking, exhibiting schizoid and erratic behavior. The findings of the psychological analysis also emphasized that on the day of the tragic events, Lissa acted with full awareness of her actions. After a long trial that lasted 10 months, Lisa Maria Kaiser was found guilty of the crime against her children. The Pachincha Provincial Court sentenced her to 34 years and eight months imprisonment. In addition to this, she was ordered to pay David a compensation of more than $20,000. It was noted in the press that Lisa remained calm throughout the proceedings and only showed emotion when her children were mentioned. The Jaime Yanchaguano murder case, which began in August 2021, appeared to be unfinished. New details were revealed during the court hearings. Lisa admitted giving her friend a white substance mixed with alcohol, but claimed she got it from David. However, the investigation proved otherwise. According to a psychiatrist who interviewed Lissa, she did not want to take Jaime's life. She wanted to intimidate his family so she could then extort money. She did demand $8,000 as ransom. Experts called the plan disorganized, which ultimately led to the crime. In addition, forensic tests revealed that it wasn't that simple. Jaime was found to have poison in his system and the cause of death was strangulation. The body was found with a shattered ribcage and wire around the neck. Lissa claimed that after her friend died, she decided to bury him under a back room and cement him in. The store owner's testimony confirmed that Lissa bought building materials during the days of Jaime's disappearance. After the party's arguments, the prosecutor's office requested a new trial in April 2022. At that trial, an additional charge of extortion was filed. Lissa called Jaime's relatives claiming he was being held by a group of gangsters and demanded $8,000 for his release. The defense relied on the lack of conclusive evidence that Lissa was involved in Jaime's murder. Nevertheless, she was found guilty and received a 22-year prison sentence, as well as a sentence to pay $5,000 to the victim's mother. While Jaime's trial was underway, the investigation of Marcus Ganto and Jose Luis Arazo 
Lisa's alleged victims, was nearing completion. Mark Escanto was 48 years old, and tests conducted after his death revealed traces of the same substance that Lisa had given to her children. In addition, Mark was found to have severe inflammation of the stomach. The family's lawyer claimed that Lisa met Mark, offered him a beer, and then put the poison in the drink. A glass with Lisa and Mark's fingerprints, as well as a swab containing the woman's DNA, was provided to authorities. Alleged motives for the murder included jealousy and money. It is also known that Lisa had asked Mark to help her financially, and there is evidence that he loaned her at least $120. Mark was Lisa's first known victim. The final outcome of this case, as well as that of Jose Luis Arazo, remain unknown. They may not have been reported in the press, or the investigation may not yet have reached the stage of being formally charged and brought to trial. At the time of her brutal crimes, Lisa Maria was only 26 years old. Her high-profile criminal case has become one of the most horrific and disturbing in Ecuador's recent history. These crimes made her known throughout the country as Doña Venado. Lisa Maria Kaisi is recognized as a serial killer in Ecuador. Her victims have endured terrible suffering, and their relatives have suffered unbearable pain. The charges include five murders and nine attempted murders. Under Ecuadorian law, the maximum sentence she could face is 40 years in prison. That means Lissa could be released when she turns 70 years old. It is still unclear what motivated Doña Venado to commit such horrific acts. Was her act the result of resentment for not getting what she expected in life? Many speculate that the motive was money, and in David's case, Lissa acted out of a lust for revenge, which led to the tragedy with her children. The most horrific part of this story is not only the number of victims left in the path of Doña Venado, but also the fate of two innocent children who could not have guessed that their mother, who gave them life, would take it away so absurdly and cruelly. This case is of India's first famous perfume expert, Monica Good. The reason for Monica's murder and the method used by the killer shook the entire India. The date was actually October 6, 2016. Monica Gurdi resided in the village named Sangolda in the famous state of Goa in India. Goa is known for its famous beaches, culture, climate, and historical places. Besides, here you can also get a chance to witness colorful architecture, greenery, and beautiful sunsets daily. Actually, Monica lived in a three-bedroom rented apartment in a society named Sapnaraj Valley in Sangolda village. As usual, at around 9 to 10 in the morning, Monica's maid arrives at her house and rings the doorbell of Monica's apartment. However, there is no response from inside. Then the maid rings the bell again, but still no response. Then she tries calling out several times and rings the bell three or four more times. Additionally, she knocks on the door, but still there is no sound from inside and no one opens the door. This situation feels very strange to the maid because Monica has never done this before. Feeling a little anxious now, she calls Monica's brother, Armand Gurda, who lives in Mumbai, and explains the entire situation to him. After this, Monica's brother Anand calls Monica's phone, but there is no response from the other end. He keeps trying to connect with his sister through calls, but Monica doesn't pick up the phone. After that, Amand calls Monica's neighbor, who lived in the adjacent apartment, and Monica had also left a duplicate key to her. Shortly after Amand's call, the woman arrives outside Monica's house with the duplicate key. She then opens the door with the same duplicate key, and as soon as Monica's neighbor and her maid enter the house, both scream because Monica was lying straight on the bed, and hands were tied behind the bed, and there was no clothing on the lower part of her body. Additionally, Monica was not moving at all. Seeing all this, Monica's neighbor immediately calls the police. Soon after, the Goa police arrive at Monica's apartment with some lady police officers, an ambulance, and doctors. However, when some doctors cover Monica's body and check her pulse, it is found that Monica has passed away. Afterwards, the dead body is sent for post-mortem, and then the room is searched. The police searched the room, but the surprising thing was that there was no evidence of forced entry anywhere in the entire apartment. There were eggshells in the room, suggesting they had been eaten recently. Then Monica's purse was checked, but apart from some debit card bills, the police found no evidence in it. 
Now, to find evidence, the police consider examining all the CCTV footage in the society. But then they find out that there are no CCTV cameras installed in that society. Besides this, the police also question the people living in Sapnaraj Valley. However, nobody has seen any suspicious person entering or leaving Monica's house in the past day. Nevertheless, the police also investigate from the angle of theft. But nothing was missing from Monica's flat that could indicate that this murder was committed for theft. Looking at all these things, the police believe that whoever murdered Monica had some information about her because no one forcefully entered the flat and nothing was stolen from the house. However, Monica was married, but due to some disputes, she had been living alone for a year. Therefore, the police's suspicion first falls on Monica's husband, Bharath Ramanrutham. After that, the police interrogate him about this murder, but nothing comes to light during the interrogation that would make them suspect him. In fact, Monica was the daughter of a former judge in Mumbai, Ramesh Kuda, and she was initially a photographer, but later she started researching on perfumes. After this, in a short span of time, she became a successful perfume expert. Due to her profession, Monica was quite famous not only in her society, but also throughout the city, often seen hobnobbing with big businessmen. Therefore, as soon as news of Monica's murder surfaced, the entire state of Goa was in shock. At that time, this was the news running on every news channel in the country, and the public wanted to know who the mystery killer was. Meanwhile, Monica's post-mortem report also arrives, revealing that Monica died due to suffocation, and it also becomes clear that she was raped. Anyway, the police had investigated the case from every angle so far, but they had neither found any suspects nor any clues. But then, during the investigation that evening, a police officer suddenly remembers that they had found some debit card bills from Malika's purse, but they hadn't found any debit card during the entire search. Afterwards, the Goa police approach the bank regarding the bills of that debit card and request to check the transaction details of that card. It is found out that on the morning of October 6th at 6 o'clock, this card was used at an ATM in Porvarim area. Porvarim is merely four to five kilometers away from Sapnaraj Valley. Following this, the police instruct the bank to keep an eye on this card and also scrutinize the CCTV footage of the ATM in Porvarim. The face of the boy who withdrew money from that card was captured on the ATM camera. Subsequently, with the CCTV footage in hand, the Goa police reach Sapnaraj Valley. As soon as the local see this footage, they recognize the boy shown in the footage immediately and identify him as Raj Kumar, who used to be the old security guard here. However, he was fired from his job two months ago on charges of theft. For the Goa police, this was a major success because for the first time in this case, the police had a name and a face of suspect. Now, when the police check Rajkumar's background, they find out that Rajkumar, 21, is from Bathinda City in Punjab State, and there have been several theft cases registered against him before. The police had all the information about Rajkumar, but the challenge now was how to catch him. So, to catch Rajkumar, the Goa police started waiting for the next transaction from Monica's debit card. Some time passes, and suddenly, the police find out that recently, some money has been withdrawn from an ATM in Bangalore City using this card. Let us tell you that Bangalore City is about 370 miles away from Sangolda village. Upon seeing this, the Goa police immediately spring into action and contact the Bangalore City police. After that, Bangalore police check the CCTV footage of that ATM, and Rajkumar's face was clearly visible in the footage of that ATM as well. Following this, Bangalore police took Rajkumar's photo and began questioning all hotels and lodges around that ATM. After a while, a man at the reception of a one hotel recognizes Rajkumar's photo and says, Yes, a man with this face is staying in our hotel, but he has gone out for some work right now. Afterwards, some police officers dressed in civilian clothes stand outside the same hotel waiting for Rajkumar to arrive. But as soon as Rajkumar returns to the hotel after a while, the police officers recognize him and apprehend him. Now, 
because the police officers were in civilian clothes, Rajkumar doesn't even recognize them. And just like that, on October 8, 2016, two days after Monica's murder, Rajkumar is arrested from a hotel in Bangalore. Then Goa police are contacted. Afterwards, the Goa police arrive in Bangalore and take Rajkumar to Goa with transit remand from the court. Now, the interrogation begins, and due to the firm questioning by the police, Rajkumar admits to killing Monica. When the police ask him why he did it, he narrates his entire story to the police, and the story goes something like this. Actually, in the month of June, 39-year-old Monica decides to shift to Goa for her perfume business, for which Monica starts looking for a rented flat, and on June 7, 2016, she reaches Sapna Raj Valley to see a flat. At the society's gate, Monica meets security guard Raj Kumar, and the society's management had already called Raj Kumar beforehand, informing him that a woman would come to see a flat, so show her the flat. Afterwards, Raj Kumar shows Monica the flat, and after seeing it, Monica leaves from there. But what happens here is that during showing the flat, Rajkumar falls in love with Monica unilaterally. Now, day and night, he kept thinking only about Monica. About four to five days pass like this, and then one day Rajkumar becomes very happy because that day Monica had come to shift to Sapna Raj Valley with her belongings. After that, Monica tells Rajkumar that the flat he showed her, he has taken that flat. Now, because Rajkumar was very happy, he himself, with the help of two people, delivers Monica's belongings to her apartment. Rajkumar does this because he wanted to see Monica repeatedly, but because he was a security guard, he didn't get many chances to see and meet Monica. But then one day an idea comes to his mind, and he goes to his manager and says that he wants to do the cleaning and maintenance work of the society's cars along with his duty, because he is in desperate need of money. After hearing Rajkumar's need, the manager also agrees to his proposal because he thinks that this way Rajkumar will earn some extra money and the needs of the people living in the society will also be fulfilled. However, Rajkumar had something else in his mind and after this, he goes straight to Monica's apartment. After that, he tells Monica that now he can also clean her car, but it will cost her some extra money. Monica also agrees to this because she didn't have enough time to do household chores while handling her business. Now, Rajkumar started cleaning Monica's car and would use the pretext of exchanging keys to also visit Monica's apartment, where he would see Monica three or four times a day. But it was due to the cleaning of this very car that one day Rajkumar loses his job. It so happened that one day, Monica's umbrella went missing from this car. Monica asks Rajkumar about it but he says he didn't see any umbrella in the car. After this, Monica complains to the society management and says that today, not only my umbrella, but many other person's things have gone missing just like before. If such incidents continue to happen in the society, it will tarnish its reputation. Now, after hearing Monica's complaint, the society management takes this matter seriously and begins an investigation. It is then found out that only Rajkumar used to open Monica's car for cleaning besides Monica herself. After that, a search is conducted in the guard room where Rajkumar used to stay, and Monica's umbrella is also recovered from there. Now, since thefts were already a concern in society, after Monica's umbrella is found, suspicion falls entirely on Rajkumar. As a result, on July 22, 2016, Rajkumar is dismissed from his job on theft charges. From here, the story takes a new turn. While Rajkumar had deeply loved Monica before, now he starts to harbor a significant amount of hatred towards her. However, after being dismissed from his job, Rajkumar leaves and starts working as a laborer in the Ponda area of Goa. But even there, he only works for a few days. During this time, he meets Monica twice and asks her to withdraw the theft complaint, but Monica flatly refuses. Now, hearing this, Rajkumar gets even angrier but he couldn't do anything at that moment. After that, Rajkumar arrives in Chennai in search of a job, then goes to Mumbai from there and finally spends some time working in Pune city. Everywhere, Rajkumar earns his living by doing odd jobs, but when he doesn't find any decent job anywhere, he returns to Goa on the 2nd of October 2016. But this time, he had something planned in Goa, 
There was still a lot of hatred against Monica in his mind. The very next day, that is, on the 3rd of October in the afternoon, Rajkumar reaches Sapna Raj Valley again. He enters the society through the main gate, and by chance, no one sees him entering. Then he goes straight to Monica's apartment below, but he notices that Monica's car is not parked there. Seeing this, he understands that Monica is not at home at the moment. However, instead of leaving from there, Rajkumar decides to wait for Monica to arrive in the society. Now, because Rajkumar knows every route in the society, he decides to hide on the terrace of the society because, generally, no one comes to the terrace. Meanwhile, Rajkumar keeps looking down repeatedly and checks Monica's car, but even after the whole October 3rd passes, Monica's car is not seen. Then the next day, October 4th comes, but Monica's car still doesn't show up, and then October 4th also passes. On October 5th, Monica's car was checked several times by Rajkumar since morning, but it wasn't seen. Now, it had been almost two days since he stayed on the terrace. There was neither food to eat nor anything to drink on the terrace during this time. Many times, Rajkumar felt like leaving from there, but the fire of revenge didn't let him go, and fueled by this vengeance, Rajkumar spent more than 48 hours hungry and thirsty on the terrace, around 3 to 3.30 p.m. on October 5th, 2016. Rajkumar came down once again, and this time he saw Monica's car parked. This meant that Monica had returned home. Seeing this, there was a strange smile on Rajkumar's face, but then he went back to the terrace and started waiting for darkness. After that, he comes downstairs around 6.30 in the evening and rings Monica's flat doorbell. When Monica asks who, Rajkumar identifies himself as a security supervisor. Hearing this, Monica opens the door, but as soon as she does, Rajkumar forcefully pushes her and then shuts the door from inside. Before Monica can comprehend anything, Rajkumar takes out a knife from his pocket and warns her, if you make noise, I'll stab you. Still, Monica screams loudly to protect herself, but Rajkumar covers her mouth with his hand. Then Rajkumar takes Monica to the bathroom, intimidating and controlling her. After that, he forcefully takes Monica to the bedroom at knife point, lays her on the bed, ties both her hands behind the bed first, then ties both her legs as well. Now, Rajkumar demands money from Monica at knife point. Upon seeing herself trapped, Monica also gets very nervous, so she tells the Rajkumar, take all the money in the purse. After that, the Rajkumar empties Monica's entire purse. About 4,000 Indian rupees come out of the purse like $48, but the Rajkumar's desire is not satisfied with that, and he asks Monica for more money. So Monica says, I only have this much money right now. If you need more money, I have a debit card. Take it and withdraw money from the ATM. The Rajkumar didn't know how to use a debit card. Still, he learns from Monica how to use it. So systematically, Monica tells him the way to withdraw money, how to insert the card into the ATM machine, then select the language, and then how to enter the secret pin. And along with that, she also tells him her debit card's pin number. I think, maybe in that situation, Monica feels that now Rajkumar will leave her and go from here. Then she will complain to the police and Rajkumar will be caught through the location of the debit card. But Rajkumar takes the money and card and puts a cloth in Monica's mouth. After doing all this, he now knew that Monica could not do anything, so he leaves from there with great confidence and then goes to the kitchen. He takes out water from the fridge, boils the eggs, eats them with great ease, and there was no hurry for him. He was eating and drinking with great comfort because he knew that Monica lived alone in that flat. Now, he also takes out ice cream from the fridge and eats it. Besides, he also eats chocolate, meaning that all the hunger and thirst he had been suffering for two days on the terrace is satisfied now. It was around 12 o'clock at night by all this. When his stomach is full again, he returns to Monica. He takes her phone, although it was locked, but Rajkumar's unlock it by forcing Monica. Then Rajkumar opens an adult site on her phone and forcibly shows her three adult videos. Feeling all this, Monica becomes even more anxious because she realized that Rajkumar was not going to let her go now. Then Rajkumar unties the rope from Monica's legs, 
and removes all the clothes from her waist down. Then he fulfills his desire that had been in his mind since the first day he saw Monica. It was nearly 2 a.m. in the morning by now, and Rajkumar had been in Monica's apartment for almost eight hours when Rajkumar's desire was filled. He gets nervous for the first time when the question arises in his mind whether Monica knows him well, and if he leaves Monica alive, she will tell the police about it, and then the Rajkumar will be punished. So the prince lifted a pillow from the same bed and began to suffocate Monica's mouth and kept pressing until she died. Then the Rajkumar got up from there comfortably and went to the bathroom again. After that, Rajkumar shaved his beard, then he bathed, and at 3.30 a.m. on October 6, 2016, in the darkness, he sneaked out of the Sapna Valley stealthily. Then at 6 a.m., after withdrawing money from the ATM, he went to Bangalore, where the police arrested him. After hearing the entire story, all the police officers were quite surprised. After that, the Goa police gathers all the evidence against Rajkumar. Then, on January 6, 2017, a 228-page charge sheet is present in court, charging murder, rape, and robbery. However, the trial of this case is still ongoing. Let's see when the criminal will be punished. If there is any update in this case, we will update you through the channel's community post. So friends, this was the complete story of the Monica Gerd murder case. If you appreciate our efforts, like and share this video. If you haven't subscribed, do so now. Thank you.